Hi, welcome to the Catholic Corner. I'm Monsignor Walter Nolan, and now I'm at location at the residence of our new bishop, Bishop David O'Connell, the 10th bishop of the Diocese of Trenton. Marvelous to have you, Bishop. Thank you. Marvelous Thanks. to have you. Thanks, Monsignor. Bishop O'Connell, as hopefully most of you know, was named Bishop of Trenton on December 1st, 2010. But he had come to our diocese a few months earlier as the coadjutor bishop on June 4th. For the past 12 years before he came to the Diocese of Trenton, Bishop O'Connell was um, at Catholic University as the president of Catholic University. That's a <laughs> major job, Bishop. A major a stress. job. Major, major <laughs> job. And while he was there, besides being the president and working with students and faculty and all the things that presidents have to do, Pope Benedict XVI came to visit Catholic University. And he, as well as he gave the address at the, uh, to the Catholic educators there, which is a marvelous, marvelous gift to us. Bishop O'Connell has a national reputation for writing, for his media appearances. Uh, I would now say a little poetry. <laughs> you might even recognize him because he was a frequent guest on CNN's The Situation Room with Wolf Blitzer. Welcome again, Bishop. Really, it's just, just so good to have you here. Thank you, Monsignor. You know, we've been blessed, haven't we, in the Diocese of Trenton. We've had some marvelous bishops, and now you come as another, another beautiful guy to be with us and the priests and uh, all the, the folks of the, of the diocese. And uh, I know sometimes I heard the expression, the, the, the great diocese of Trenton. I, I, guess, I guess that'll... <laughs> that's that'll a continue. Smithism. That's a Smithism. Okay, so we... <laughs> <laughs> I guess you'll have an ism yourself somehow yeah, or other with that. But that's terrific. Now, I understand you grew up not too far from Trenton in Pennsylvania? Yeah, right, actually right across the bridge. I grew up, I uh, was born in Philadelphia and was raised in Langhorne, Pennsylvania. And is that where you went to school, uh, all the things that kids do? I went to grammar school there and the parish school and my whole life, and of course in Catholic education, mm -hmm. went to the grammar school there. And then I actually went to high school in Princeton. Ah, was that at the seminary high school? Yeah, at the prep seminary in uh, Princeton. Yeah, a great, Terrific. great four years I spent there. I, I loved Princeton. Well, you know, when I was at Notre Dame High School as a, as a priest, and uh, uh, some of the students would come down, and sometimes we'd you know share a little basketball or this or that. Oh, like, sure. I mean, every time I went up there, I used to say, "Gee, where was I? I was a kid. How come you tell me about this when I was a kid?" But that is that is terrific. Yeah, it was a great school. Well, beside beside you know growing up in uh, here in high school in Princeton. Um, your vocation to the priesthood. We all have a story, and somehow God calls us all in different ways. And, it's, it's, and the more I speak about it or the more I think about it, the more I'm, I just marvel at, at the hand of God and how, how he kind of gets all of us in some way, shape, or form. How about yourself, Bishop? How did, you, how did your vocation start? Or? It's, a, it's a great story. Uh, when I was in second grade, my grandmother was, was pretty sick. She was dying of cancer. And I just have such a vivid memory of my pastor, wonderful Irish guy, coming to the house. And you remember those days, everything was in Latin, yeah, and yeah. you met the priest at the door with a candle, and it sure. was very mysterious. Sure. And just as a, as a young kid watching all of this take place, but seeing how kind he was to my grandmother and her sickness. And I always had that in my mind, that I wanted to be just like him. Uh, in that special time. And then, of course, growing up, being an altar boy and going through all the, all, all the things you go through in uh, Catholic high school, being uh, uh, one of the kids that would help out the sisters in the parish. And uh, I just grew very, very close to the church uh, through those years. And when I was in, I think, seventh grade, I got on a bus. And it was after one of those great vocation days that they used to have in the Archdiocese of Philadelphia where you'd go around and get all the literature from the missionary groups. And I sent away uh, uh, one of the pieces of literature to the Vincentians. Mm. Vincentians were the only one who wrote me back. And they kept in touch with me, and I eventually went to, uh, to their seminary. That's amazing. You, you know what, I, I, and with the Vincentians, because you don't, you don't hear the Vincentians a lot, at least where I grew up, and yet my parents had a friend who was very friendly with the Vincentian. Uh, Father Gay, I don't even know if you would remember him, and I think he was yeah. down in Germantown. Yeah. And I remember as a as a high school kid going down on a little trip down there, and yeah, that he, was the first time I heard of of the Vincentian. He was stationed in Germantown. He was also stationed in Emmitsburg, and his nephew 
is now the superior general of the Vincentians. Is that right? Yeah. Isn't that a small world? It is. It's amazing. I could have bumped into you somewhere on, a, yeah, on one of those bus trips. You might have. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrific. Now, was there, was there anything else besides, was there anything specific, like any confirmation that all of a sudden you said, yeah, this is God's really calling me? You know, it was more gradual than that. And, you know, the, this pastor, I think he had it in his mind that I was going to yeah, become a priest. Yeah. And so he was very attentive to me. Like a funny story, you know, we used to get the host from the Pink Nuns down in Philly, and the pastor would come in every month, and he'd, oh, all right, who wants to go with me to get the host from the Pink Nuns? And of course, everybody's, oh, I do, I do. And O'Connell, every month he would take me in his big yeah. green Chrysler, and we'd go down to Horn and Hard Arts, have a sandwich, and go see the Pink Nuns. And, uh, you know, I'd talk to him a lot and spend a lot of time around the rectory. So I don't think it was any one particular thing, but it was a series of things yeah. that just made me believe that I was being called to the priesthood. And then when I went to this high school in Princeton, St. Joe's was terrific. The priests that I met there were just such sterling guys, yeah. wonderful guys, great holy guys and uh, full of fun and joy. Uh, I think that's when I really felt uh, the confirmation. And you know, I would, I, I would echo that in a sense that uh, all the Vincentians that I met and just having done some of the work with some of the Vincentians, sure. I think you're right. You are a, a good bunch of guys. Yeah, you know, you know? we're meat and potatoes really, guys. We're just yeah, kind of blue-collar families yeah, yeah. and uh, uh, really good, good, yeah. solid guys. And you have a great love of priests and priesthood as, as well. We, yeah, that's the good charism. fraternity. A good, yeah, good the fraternity. Charism. Yeah. Now, most of the time when, you know, uh, God gives us lots of different gifts and as priests, we can, gosh, the, the, the doors open so wide for, for us to, uh, to share what God calls us to or the gifts that we might particularly have. It seems to me, from what I know a little bit, you, you had a great gift to be in education. So a lot of your priesthood was around education. It seems that uh, you were director of uh, student activities at Archbishop Wood High School, so you did some high school work. And then after that, uh, various positions at St. John's University, which is a, a great university. When I was looking at this, I said, gee, no basketball coach next to it, though. I guess <laughs> I guess they had a... I went to the games. <laughs> uh, well, they had a famous coach for a long time, I think. Oh, what a great guy. You know? yeah, he was great. Yeah. But it, that's, that is true. But then you went to uh, study a little canon law and, and, uh, and did some work with canon law at, at your own seminary, I think Mary Immaculate Seminary in uh, Northampton, Pennsylvania. Yeah, yeah. Which again was a, a marvelous, uh, marvelous place. Yeah, a great place. In fact, I, I probably never, we never had a chance to talk about a lot of these things. But a few years back when I did a little personal work, we actually sent a priest there who was, who was, who was out of the priesthood for a little while and came back, but we wanted him to, to catch up on some, some education and oh, all. Wow. And he went there and, um, uh, and you were gracious enough, the, the priests were gracious enough there to house him for a year or so, a year and a half. And, it, it worked out fairly well, and then he went to another diocese after, uh, after I, I spent I wonder, all his time with him. I wonder if I was there when he was I don't there. know. You could have been. Because I, I, I studied there as a seminarian, uh -huh. but then I went back there several years later as a faculty member. In fact, I was on the, the last faculty before we closed the seminary. Wow. I, you might have been there then. You, yeah, you actually might have, might have been there at the same time. And then you pursued, at the same time, you were, you were studying yourself, uh, pursuing your, your, your doctorate in canon law in, at, uh, at Catholic University. And guess what? You became president. <laughs> <laughs> I never would have expected it, let me tell you. <laughs> the hand of God is just, just it's marvelous. Amazing. Isn't it? when you it look is, back, it's amazing. Yeah, and you look back and you say, God, it's almost like he just puts you at the right spots and you met the, the people that you should meet and study yeah. what you should study and, and somehow your own natural gifts kind of just flow out of that. And then uh, what, uh, with all the education and all that background, how does it, how does it affect you or how does, how does it kind of you know, have you seen it kind of molding you in a sense to not only the work at the university, but also to be to become a bishop? Well, you know, I, I wonder about that uh, because initially my idea of the Vincentians was missionary work. Sure, sure. A lot of their literature was kind of uh, fantastic presentations of their work sure. in the missions in China and in Panama and other places. Uh, so that was in my mind as, as an interest. However, because of those years at Princeton, uh, and we had great access to Princeton University at the time, and we would go even as high school kids to the activities of the university, I just really fell in love with uh, reading and with learning. And I think there's a little bit of it, you know, just to, I, I come from a family of four boys, uh, and just to make my mark, my distinction, my two older brothers were sports enthusiasts, and they, were, they weren't so interested in school. 
And I thought, well, I've got to be different than them, so I'm going to get very interested in school. That's going to be the thing that I do. So I, I, I really became very uh, sort of an egghead, I guess, in a way. You know, I just got very interested in reading and study. And that stayed with me all my life. And so when the Vincentian Superior came to see me before I was ordained, he, uh, he gave me this great assignment to Archbishop Wood High School in the Archdiocese of Philly. And it was fantastic, uh, fantastic three years. Well, Chris, I love being with kids, you know, sure. you can't beat it. And, sure. you know, we had a lot of fun sure. and playing sports with them. Of course, I was a lot younger there in those days and uh, could do a lot more. But taking the kids out and uh, just, just giving them a, a sense of the priesthood, letting them see the priesthood. Uh, and 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 the, the possibilities was was so important. But as you say, you know the the career moved the way it did. I was asked to study canon law, uh, which I didn't study too well when I was a seminarian. You know, I never thought I'd need too much. Well, canon law was one of those subjects yeah, that you kind of, well, I can look it up in a book. Yeah, it was like church history and canon law were the two subjects. <laughs> well, there was you, always some expert like yourself that you could yeah, call up on the phone. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but you know, I went to Catholic U and I loved to study it. And it was at the time when the canon law was changing. Everybody in my community, everybody I knew, had the old code, and I was trained in the old code of canon law. So it was all new, so it was learning, uh, something that I would be able to make a contribution to the order, to the Vincentians. Um, and after I came out of uh, Catholic U, I went to Mary Immaculate Seminary and taught in a seminary uh, for a couple of years. It was my least favorite assignment. I thought this was going to be the great assignment of my life, and it just was, I just didn't, too confining? Well, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, I admire guys who teach in the seminary. It's a hidden ministry. Yeah. It's a hidden work, yeah. you know. And, and at that time, you know, the seminarians, I always felt that the, there was nothing you could teach them. They kind of <laughs> had, had the attitude they knew it all, and you, they just tolerated you. And, uh, but then I went on to St. John's. I was the academic dean there. Yeah. And a fantastic eight yeah. years. There was wonderful, yeah. wonderful time. Went back to my alma mater, yeah. college alma mater at Niagara University for a year to be the uh, vice president for academics, and then got the call from, uh, from Washington to, uh, to let my name go forward for Catholic U, and never in a million years did I think I would go there. I just thought, ah, they're trying to even out the slate of candidates, you know, because I thought, ah, I was 42 at the time, I was too young, you know, all the other presidents were so much older, and many of them were bishops and uh, very accomplished people, you know, so I was real surprised when I got the call from the chairman of the board uh, saying, uh, he said to me, well, you really didn't want that job, do you? And I said, oh, no, your eminence. I said, I really didn't want it. I never, he said, wait, wait, wait a minute. You got the job. I'm just teasing you. <laughs> and so I went there and I had a great 12 years, fantastic time. Yeah. I don't know, I've listened to being a president or academic dean is a lot of responsibility. And yet when you're around young people, I, I even said to myself one time, or you know, uh, someone said, "Gee, you work hard." They said, "No, it's not even work. You know, you just you just there. It's just that you just you know, you, you they just bring you along almost. Absolutely, you know, it you really know, is. It's they energize you. They do. They they, yeah. they they and still, you know, even visiting in the diocese. When I go to a school to celebrate mass, I always try to make sure that I have a chance to go around and visit in the classrooms. And I just jump, walk into the classrooms and sure. uh, probably drive the teachers crazy, but the kids are just so full of life and energy. Um, this past uh, Martin Luther King holiday, you know, we have the, it's not a day off, it's a day on. So I went to the chancery and there were so many of our kids there making sandwiches and putting together bags for, for the homeless and for people in need. And I just thought, isn't this great? You know the Stuff that we would never really think of doing when we were kids. It was just, you never did it. I and mean, you didn't have the volunteerism that you have now. But a Catholic U, uh, f first of all, Catholic U had drifted a bit. And it really needed to work on its own Catholic identity and character. And that, I think that's why I was brought there. Because I had already had a bit of a reputation for focusing on that. Um, but when I got there, I found kids desperate to be Catholic. They really wanted to learn. They wanted to know about their faith. I brought a campus minister with me, Franciscan, wonderful priest, Father Bob Schlageter. And he single-handedly transformed the internal spiritual life of the campus. Um, and working together, Father Bob and myself, we were able to walk among the students so easily. Um, 
and you know, I made a decision as president there. You know, a lot of presidents, presidents do a lot of things, and there's a lot of responsibility, especially fundraising and the call to be outside of the campus. Whenever I was on that campus, I made sure I ate with the students, I visited with the students, I went to some of their activities, tried to catch their games or their musical performances or whatever Means it was. Means a lot. To, Means a to lot. be present. Means a lot. And I'll tell you, yeah. and you know, even, even in terms of vocations, you know, Father Bob and I, you know, we, we used to strategize and scheme about a lot of things. We, we planned this vocation discernment group for young men and for young women. We started it as soon as I arrived there. Eighty guys went to the seminary over these 12 years, Terrific. and 30 girls went to the convent. Terrific. All it takes is to show the interest. And the kids used to say to me, we were never, no one ever asked us. You know, and besides showing the interest, to smile. They got to yeah. see us joyful. You know, I see it's joyful. Monsignor, that is so, so true. I have said that to priests so often. Yeah. We have to be men <laughs> of joy. You know, Absolutely. even as priests, as, through, through ordinary days, you know, there's sure. a lot of pressure at times sure. and things that are difficult to deal with. Sure. But you always got to show that you're a man of joy, sure. despite the sacrifice, despite the commitment, despite the things that you have to do in the course of your average day. <laughs> to be a Christian, to be a follower of Jesus is a joyful thing. <laughs> That's that's what it that's what it's all about. That's what it's, you know, all, about. it's, what it's all about. You know, it's so beautiful talking to you, Bishop, and, and comfortable talking to you. And I know you've had a lot of experience with you know in camera and doing a lot of things that you know nationally and your reputation. How was that gift discovered? How did you how did you find out that uh, that you're very comfortable and in, in, in nationally speaking to people and and uh, even with some of your writings? Well, you know, when you read a lot, the the, the the next step, the jump to writing is not difficult. And I had an interest in writing, uh, did a lot of writing, did a lot of essays and uh, other things. Of course, as you're going through to become a, a faculty member, to become a professor, you know, there's an ob obligation to do some scholarly research and writing. So it goes with the job. Uh, so that, that kind of interest was already there and it was just a question of cultivating it and fine-tuning it. I was in a lot of uh, theatrical productions, going through high school, oh. college. Uh, I loved the theater, I loved the stage. And so uh, when I was given the opportunity to, uh, to do television, some television work, it, it just seemed natural to me. I mean, my, first, my first television appearance, I think, was on Good Morning America. And it was, a, of course, I'm a canon lawyer, and it was a conversation about annulments, and I was interviewed about annulments. Then I was one of the commentators for Pope John Paul's visit mm -hmm. to the United States, to New York, where I was living at the time, and so I was there for both of his visits to the U.S. And then uh, as president of Catholic University, of course the position is a, is a national position, you know, I would get a lot of requests to comment on things, usually things that were coming out of the Holy See or the Vatican. Uh, so I would talk, when a pope would write an encyclical or something like that, I'd be interviewed, you know, and of course I'd have to rush to read the encyclical before the interview. Uh, and then when Pope John Paul grew ill, I got a call from uh, CNN uh, if I would come down and do the show. So I came down and did a spot on the show with Wolf Blitzer, as you mentioned, great guy, dear friend. And that night got a call from Peter Jennings. And... And it just took off from there. You know, once you go on a show, everybody's watching every other show. And Especially you know, when you can tell some stories and, yeah, uh, yeah, and, you and be you, yourself. You come across as a sure. normal person. Uh, now you're here at Trenton. What excites you about Trenton? Everything excites Everything. me about Trenton. The great diocese, <laughs> <is> <laughs> my <laughs> predecessor, as a bishop, what a great guy he is. And what love he had for the diocese, yeah. for the priests, for the faithful of the diocese. Um, it, it was really... Uh, kind of infectious in a way when I first met him. I didn't really know him. We were one of the few bishops in the Northeast that I really didn't know. Uh, and uh, I'm sure he was very surprised, as I was very surprised, to be asked to come to Trenton. Um, but just in, in my months as the coadjutor and in just the uh, December during the season of Advent, going to the different parishes, including your own on Christmas Day, which I'm so grateful for, it's a beautiful mass that good. day. I good, good. The people it. loved it. Oh, yeah, it so, loved it. and the place was jammed. Yeah. I couldn't believe everybody up at seven. They probably hadn't gone to bed yet. It's <laughs> seven in the morning. But meeting with people, talking with people, hearing their enthusiasm and interest, 
Uh, a lot of people talking to me about education, I guess because they know that's my background. You know, Catholic education's in my blood, in a way. Um, you know, I, I see that the, the ground is very fertile for, for doing some more good. There's been a lot of good accomplished here in the diocese, and the people are so good-natured and so eager to, to, do, uh, to do what they can mm -hmm. for the church and for the gospel. Mm -hmm. You know, the one thing, as you know, I've said to the priest that causes me a little bit of concern is, you know, only 25% of our Catholic population are going to Mass on Sunday. This is, uh, mm -hmm. at least by the estimates that we have, the counts that we have. Out of 850,000 Catholics in this huge diocese, mm -hmm. that's not a lot. And so I, I want to work with our priests and our religious and our deacons and the lay faithful to try to determine what it is that we need to do to draw people back, to welcome them back to the practice of their faith, but especially to get to Mass, because they hear the Word of God, they hear it explained by the priest, uh, they have an opportunity to be together and, uh, with other believers and celebrate their identity as Catholics. You know, it's such a beautiful yeah, I th thing. And I think people are really looking for that, Bishop. Yeah. I mean, lots of them are. They yeah. really are in many ways, and I hope that uh, we all can share some thoughts on how how we can vitalize that, because uh, there's lots of great people. In well, you know, you, you as a pastor, and the other pastors that I've met with, you know, I've been to every deanery, mm -hmm. and I've met all but, I think, about five of our priests in the diocese, so uh, I'm really eager to hear from our pastors and our priests, you know, what it is from their specific vantage point. I mean, the bishop, okay, the bishop is uh, kind of a symbol of unity and a symbolic figure. Where the rubber meets the road is in the parishes. That's where the diocese lives. And so it's very important to me to be able to have this kind of conversation with the pastors and the priests who have the responsibility. I mean, they're the people that are, you know, the ground troops, sure, as you were. They're the sure, people that, sure. that the people turn sure. to in their need. Yeah, I've always called us the infantry. You know, we're yeah, like the artillery yeah. and infantry. We're out there in the foxholes and yeah. might as well find out what's, uh, and, and what the, we can do. And the priests who work in the chancery sure. are, are wonderful guys and very deeply committed, but it's in the parish, sure. you know, and, uh, and in a way in the schools, too. And that's that's uh, that's so important too. To and me. then I know you you have your heart set on education and Catholic education. We have a your appeals coming up soon, and that's a focus that uh, be, be be beautiful for you as you enter the first couple of months of your yeah. uh, your uh, new uh, bishopric here. This uh, this campaign is you know of course is a series of firsts for me, and uh, this campaign is uh, is going to be this year focused on. Uh, Catholic education, but not Catholic education alone. What we're trying to do is we're trying to put, uh, I increased the goal by a million so that I could put back into the hands of parents uh, a million bucks in tuition assistance uh, because I made a commitment that I wouldn't close a school in the next academic year. Now, I don't know that I can make that pledge beyond that, but we're going to work hard and strategize and do our best to try to keep our Catholic schools alive and vibrant. I always say we have the vision, the value, the commitment, the sacrifice, all of that. What we don't have is the numbers, students, and the funds needed to keep them going. The data is all there. Catholic schools uh, are tremendous in what they're able to accomplish and do for our, uh, our youngsters, especially the poor and, and those who are minorities. I mean, the, the, the statistics are... Uh, out of the ballpark. You know, in, in, uh, in listening to that, uh, my, my experience anyway is that when you ask people to help, they love to help with education. Yeah. I wouldn't even be surprised if that wasn't true at the, at the university level. There's a, there's a, you know, if you ask people for, to help and they say, well, uh, you mean to, to paint the roof? <laughs> <laughs> That's one thing. But when you say, no, well, I'd like to help educate some children. I'd like to help to, to, to bring children into, into the awareness of our faith. And you know, there's a real interest out it's there. It's concrete. Yeah. And people understand that in helping the young, we're helping the next generation. Right. We're, help, we're, we're making a contribution to the world. And that's, that's really important. You mentioned the university. I used to say, of course, everybody would expect me to say uh, Catholic University is the best thing since sliced bread, you know. But if I would take some students along with me on some of these calls, especially the fundraising calls and solicitations, I didn't have to say a word. All I had to do is let these children speak, these youngsters speak. But that's even true, Bishop, I think, all the way down to the grammar school. Absolutely. Level. You know, when the children are there and the children just naturally 
because they're not going to fake it. You know, yeah. they're going to naturally tell you this is a great school. We love coming here with it. People get excited. Do you ever notice that. how when you're in a room and children walk into the room, smile? Sure. Everybody sure. smiles. There's sure. something beautiful sure. about that. I mean, not that not that our age is the same as this present age, but uh, when I graduated high school a long, long time ago. But uh, you know, we we still our class still gets together every first Friday. Oh wow! I can't do it as much as they can. We have a mass once a year for the fellows who died. I mean, there's something. There's a tradition that can be there that I think really really reaches to the core, and that's uh, it, and it doesn't go away. You know, it I think doesn't it, go away. I think Catholic schools. Yeah really represent the future, the hope, the promise of the church. That's where the faith gets handed on. Not only mathematics and science and reading and all these other subjects, which we do teach well, but there's just something about the way that we teach and what goes on in the course of the day that makes a difference in people's lives. And that's, that's what we got to capture. Even if we don't have children in Catholic schools, even if our children are grown, we all have a responsibility to make Catholic education successful because that's how the church is going to thrive and continue into the next century. Yeah, and I, and I think it's just not only in the Catholic school, but that the whole understanding about Catholicity, whether it's uh, even on some campuses where you have some fine priests that are and, and, and lay people that are bringing the message, I think the youngsters today really want to want to see our traditions, and of course, our traditions are are based on such. Goodness and joy and giving. Yeah. And that, that's the, the whole notion of, at least you talk about volunteerism. I mean, it's just marvelous to see how many of our youngsters really want to be involved in helping people. I think what we got to do maybe a little more is to attach the theology to it so that there's a connection. That is so you know, true. You know, the kids, anybody says that the kids in our generation are not good, I'll, I'll, I'll fight with them tooth and nail. The yeah. kids in our generation, of this generation, are wonderful, wonderful kids, and they have this energy and this desire to help and to serve. But what you said is true. They don't connect it to the gospel. They don't connect it One to Jesus. One of the Jesus. questions I ask that youngsters are going to be confirmed in our parish, I said, uh, if somebody's coming down Nassau Street, you know, and gets hit and needs a glass of water, the person over here has no faith at all, this one here is a Catholic, and they both give a glass of water. What's the difference? And then I <laughs> see what they say about it and see yeah. how they can make some connections. Bishop, this has been marvelous. I hope, can, can we do another show like right after oh, this? Because I, this, we're, just so many things in my heart that I would like to share with you. Great. That's wonderful. Then you know, we'll, we'll do it. another show. God bless you, Bishop O'Connell, the 10th Bishop of the Diocese of Trent. We are so blessed. We've been blessed in the past. We're blessed now. And, uh, and the smiles and the joy, thank you. God bless you. Stay with us. Be with us. Pray with us. And allow our children to grow with the faith we have. God bless. Thanks, Bishop. Thank you. Thank you. They say America is the land of opportunity. But today, one out of every six children lives without enough. That's nearly 13 million of us living below the poverty line, struggling every day just to hang on. This is America. Together, we can do so much. Will you help? Go to povertyusa.org today and get involved.